I'd like to start maybe by giving you a sense of, of how I got here. And by that device, I want to tell you some intersecting stories. I was lucky enough to go to the University of Michigan. I studied cellular biology and political theory. <laughs> Let me tell you, that combination is not one for which there is high market demand. <laughs> and I was the editorial director of the student newspaper. And I got tangled up with an organization that met late at night and we drank too much beer and too much coffee. And this was in the late 50s. And of course, what did we do? We wrote a manifesto. <laughs> and the manifesto urged students to go work abroad in countries that needed our help. And when Jack Kennedy came to Ann Arbor in October 2060 and talked about this, he was talking about the Peace Corps and he got that idea and that language from this little student group that was kicking around in the People's Republic of Ann Arbor. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in my mind, at least, that is the proof that there is nothing more powerful than a good idea whose time has come. Because that led to the Peace Corps. And the Peace Corps led to experiences of generations of Americans who discovered that part of the divinity of our country is to help, and to help humans make the best of their predicament, and to help our world. And that is a, a spirit that is at the core of America. And it is a spirit that is being damaged by our political operations today. First job I had after graduating from Ann Arbor, I got hired as the sports editor of the paper in Fairbanks, Alaska. <laughs> so what did I do? I learned how to mush dogs. I was a terrible dog musher. I was a pretty good curler. And Fairbanks in those days was the kind of place where the sidewalks were made of wood. And the guy walked into the First National Bank of Fairbanks in the middle of a snowstorm and leaned over the counter and said, your money or your life. And the teller gave him two bags of money, and he took off. And there was a hell of a storm going on. And he jumped on a dog team and went out of town. Now, the road stopped about a mile outside of downtown Fairbanks. <laughs> and the the white off, the white out, was so bad they couldn't get the choppers up to face it. And in a couple of days, I was out at the state police post talking to the captain, and there was a hell of a dogfight out in the front of the post, which is the inevitable sign of approaching dog teams. And they had the guy, and they had the cuffs on him, and they brought him in, and he leaned over to me as he walked through the door, and he said, you know, they wouldn't have caught me if my lead dog hadn't got sick. <laughs> So I learned in Fairbanks, there isn't a hell of an opportunity in the public or private sector for people who know how to mush dogs, but don't do it well. <laughs> and I applied for a scholarship to go to Oxford University in England, and damned if I didn't win it. And so I packed my, uh, my skis and my boots and went off to England, and I read philosophy, politics, and economics. not a field in which there is noticeable career activity. <laughs> activity. In fact, in fact it, my entire career is based on learning stuff for which there were no jobs. <laughs> and I came back to the United States and got hired by Paul Todd, who was the, the congressman from Kalamazoo up the street, who was a great guy. And I ran his office. I was his chief of staff. And I added unpopular skills to the set that I already had. <laughs> and in 
And let me tell you, looking for jobs when you don't have a skill that is related to anything is hard work. And because I had been the editorial director of the Daily and newspapers were the only thing I knew, and because I didn't have any skills worthwhile anything else, I started my company and we published tiny little small town newspapers. And the big papers considered little newspapers like this beneath contempt. <laughs> but little newspapers are what pulls communities together. And people read them because they are neighbors in their own hometowns. And what we have seen in the last 20 years is the progressive destruction of tiny little community newspapers that make hometowns work. Who's engaged? Who's married? Who died? Who graduated? Who sold their house and for how much? That's a big deal. And most importantly, how do we live together as sensible people in civil discourse in a community where we are all neighbors? While I was running Paul Todd's congressional office in Washington, every Friday evening, we'd pull out the bourbon and we'd have members of Congress and their staffs come in, and they'd go from one office to the other, and we'd have a couple pops, and we would talk about how the Michigan delegation could work together to make a better country and help the state. Didn't make any difference whether people were Republican, Democrat, mugwump, anything. Now, John Dingell, who served 53 years in the US House, who's an old friend, said that kind of conversation does not happen today in the Congress today. And that's another evidence of how our political system is in the process of coming apart at the seams. Before we try to together understand better how things have got to this weird place, Let's do a quick little piece of research. And I want to ask some questions. How many of you in this room feel that you have a lot of influence on either politics or public policy in Michigan or Washington? Hands up, those with lots of influence. Bert Stanley has a lot of influence. OK? She is, she is, she is one of the more capable people I've ever met. But she's one person in a group of 160. Is that, is that right, Dick? OK. A couple other names? No, you taught me. She worked for Bill Ford, who was a hell of a congressman. But how many people really think that you've got a lot of influence in Washington and Lansing? I don't see many hands going up. There's a guy in a hat. He looks like a smart guy. <laughs> or maybe naive. <laughs> How many of you feel that organized special interests have disproportionately special access to the political process, which access is often enabled by their big contributions of money? God, I wish I had those votes. <laughs> How many of you are troubled by the amount of unreported dark money, unreported political campaigns and contributions sloshing around inside Michigan politics. Hands up those who are troubled. And how many of you think that you can get today accurate, fair-minded, thoughtful, trustworthy news about what's going on in politics from our newspapers, our cable TV, our radio stations, and what we now call journalism. How many think that you're getting the real story? <laughs> sometime yes, sometime no. Is that, is, is that, is, 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 it depends on what you watch. No, it's not. It has to do, it has to do with the difference between fake news and news 
which is empirical fact. We'll have a discussion later. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> I'm, I may be difficult, but I'm combative. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the three questions that I asked you were designed to cast light on what is really happening at the inside workings of our political system and why I believe that we are in so much trouble as a country and ultimately why I started the Center for Michigan now 12 years ago. The first issue, I think, is that we all know that over the last 20 years, what, you, what are now called legacy media, mostly meaning newspapers, have really deteriorated. And the reason they've deteriorated is not because they're run by a bunch of stumble bombs. They've deteriorated because the web has taken away basically all the advertising from these papers. 50% of the revenue of my little newspapers are what used to be called classified advertising. And you put in an ad, you want to sell, a, uh, sell your lawnmower, and you put the ad in, and it's three lines, and you pay 20 bucks. In fact, my business model was I would buy newsprint for $2,000 a metric ton, and I would buy black ink for $6 a pound, and I would smear one on the other, and I would sell it for 20 bucks an inch. <laughs> but the advertising revenue has gone away. And newspapers have exchanged selling ads for dollars per inch with selling clicks for pennies. And I know of no media company that has figured out a stable business model to account and succeed for that fundamental change in income that we are seeing in newspapers. The net result of a lot of this has been what might be called an information vacuum, which has opened up between people and their governing authorities in Lansing or Washington, because no longer do we have a news system which is devoted to the notion of accurate representation of fact, but we now have a news system in which the former responsible sources are in the process of falling apart, and what is taking their place? Social media. In social media, you articulate complex questions in tweets of 180 characters. Now, I'm not especially bright, but I don't know how to say anything, 180 characters. And most thoughtful people don't know how to do it either. And so we have detuned the nature of our discourse in part by the rise of social media and by the restrictions social media places on what might be called sane and thoughtful civil discourse. And one of the reasons that people are concerned about the rise of social media is a post that is not true on Facebook or Google looks just like a post that is true. You can't tell the difference from just looking at it. And that, in turn, has introduced the notion of fake news. A staff member in the White House said, these are alternative facts. <laughs> alternative facts. I'm pretty old-fashioned. Either a fact is a fact or it is not. I don't think you have alternative facts. But the influence and power, which is growing, and, 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 and the fact most people get most of their news through social media now. They don't get it through, well, I'm a dinosaur. I read newspapers. But most people, and, and lots of people in this room do, but most Americans get their news through social media and to some degree through cable TV. And both of these media sources are heavily influenced by how do you get as many eyeballs on your story as you possibly can, regardless of whether the stories are accurate and empirically true, as distinguished from alternative fact. And so if we have a political system 
the communications devices of which are suspect themselves. We have a political system which lacks credibility and integrity. And no wonder we are confused and worried and bothered because we don't know what the hell to think. And we don't know what's going on or what's what. Second issue that I raised to do the research with is all the unreported money flopping around in politics today. Ever since the Citizens United decision by the Supreme Court, we have seen the rise and creation of political action committees in which literally hundreds of million dollars are being raised and spent. Now, when I ran Paul Todd's campaign for re-election to the US Congress, I think we might have spent 20 grand. Today, people raise 400, 500, 600 million dollars for a relatively safe seat in the US Congress. Where's this money coming from? Nobody knows. Is the money reported under campaign rep rep reporting requirements? Nah, because the reporting requirements are loose and anyway, you don't have to report until the election's over. And the amount of money that is being spent is, is literally unprecedented. I don't know how many billions of dollars got spent in the campaign two years ago, but it was of the order of billions rather than the order of hundreds of millions. And when you have a political system in which success is denominated by hundreds of millions of dollars, you have a political system that is out of reach for ordinary people. No wonder we're skeptical. No wonder it looks weird. And a result, as a result of both these facts, the change in the media environment and the tons of money flying around, is ordinary citizens now don't have any particular access to the political process because the political actors don't really give much of a damn for what people say. And it's much more important to pander to the political action committees or to the cable TV people or the uh, social media. And who's left out of this? You. In the old days, the fantasy of old days, in a democratic system, people at the bottom talked and people at the top listened. Today, the dynamic is reversed. And the purpose of political parties is no longer to inform people, it is to tell people how to think. That's not a democratic system. That's a system that is responsible for, let's call a spade a spade, propaganda. Last. We are now seeing a, a spike of partisanship in our politics. Remember I told you about the gatherings in the congressional offices back in the mid-60s and we'd all have a pop and work together. Doesn't happen today. The first purpose of politics is to say nasty things about your opponent. And the second thing about politics is you want to be sure within your party that you can stay in line Otherwise, you'll be primaried by if you're a Republican from the right and if you're a Democrat from the left. Now, let's think what lies behind that phenomenon. The way we pick candidates to run in the general election is called a primary election, right? And in Michigan, primary elections usually take place in August. And both political parties nominate who's going to run in the general election in November, right? OK. What kinds of people vote in primary elections? It turns out that disproportionately, the kinds of people 
who vote in primary elections are highly partisan, motivated voters, either from the left or the, from the right. And the way a lot of people characterize what is going on with the political primary system is that the system is being driven by wingnuts from the left or wingnuts from the right. <laughs> and the reason that's important is most people don't vote in primary elections unless you are a highly motivated, highly partisan participant, in which case you vote like crazy. And that's one of the reasons why so many extreme candidates get nominated for public office, because they get there in a primary election. What I've just tried to do is provide you with an insight into the dynamics that undergird some of the weirdness that we see in American politics today. Well, let, let me say how I feel about that. Uh, I think you figured out that, that uh, when I feel something, I say it. Um, I think that our democratic system is coming apart at the seams. I will be 80 years old in three weeks. And I have never in my lifetime been more frightened about the future of my country than I am today. We are in trouble. And remember when Benjamin Franklin left Constitution Hall in Philadelphia at the end of the, the uh, Constitutional Convention, he was approached by a woman and said, Dr. Franklin, what kind of country are we going to have as a result of this? Franklin looked up and he says, Madam, a republic, if you can keep it. If you can keep it. And what scares the liver out of me is the assault on our democratic institutions, which have survived the Depression, which have survived World War II, which have survived the Great Recession of 1980 and thereafter, and which have been tested time after time, and have resulted in a political system which brought more people into more congruence with policy and with, 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 with good governance than any system that we have yet seen on Earth. And we are in the process of damaging and jeopardizing precisely those institutions of political governance which have enabled our survival. That's my thesis. And that's why, in 2006, I started the Center for Michigan. I built, over 40 years, a little entrepreneurial company publishing these tiny little local newspapers. And I figured out that the web was going to tear up the industry. Kathy and I decided probably we better sell it before we got a dead albatross hanging around our neck. And a couple days after we sold the company, Kathy and I were sitting at dinner. And I said, well, Kathy, we've sold the company. But I'll be damned if we move to Florida and let the sand trickle through our toes while our country goes to hell. And Kathy, being sensible, looked up and she said, well, that's a good idea. What are you going to do about it? And I said, well, I've been thinking about something that maybe is designed to mobilize the center of our country. And let's call it the Center for Michigan. And let's not call it a think tank. Let's call it a think and do tank. Think and do. How come? Well, thinking without doing is pointless. And as the former mayor of Detroit discovered, doing without thinking gets you in the slam. <laughs> So, so the Center for Michigan, I mean, the, the, the dry legal details are, are one thing, but it's, but it's a little different. The, the, it's a 501c3, thank you, federal tax code, uh, nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. Our tax standing prohibits us from endorsing in candidates, but we are not only 
allowed to, but urged to do political analysis and, and news and information. We, we do this because I believe that we need to find ways to improve the workings of our democracy so that we survive as a society in a world that is increasingly competitive, increasingly dangerous, and implausibly designed to ignore ordinary people who are speaking to, seeking to speak truth to power. So we do throw through three verbs and three verbs only. It's a grammar lesson. First verb, engage. We engage the people. We hold and have held since 2008 low community conversations all over Michigan. Ordinary people. 10, 20 at a time. And they come together in a room like this with a carefully trained facilitator with information on the topics we cover that is very, very carefully worked out and detailed and footnoted and consists of people sitting next to and talking with their neighbors because it's hard to be surly to somebody who is sitting right next to you who might be your neighbor and it works pretty well when you have 15 or 20 people in a room, but it don't work too well when you've got five or 600, because it's easy to flame people when you're in a gathering of 500. But 15 people from your town is a basis for the beginning of people working together. And as Lyndon Johnson used to say, come, let us reason together. So we hold these little community conversations uh, maybe 100, maybe 110 of them every year, all over the state. And we call forth, bottom up, the attitudes and opinions of ordinary Michigan citizens. And that's what we're interested in. And these are very carefully managed. We have highly trained facilitators. We have scribes who take notes. And the notes and the opinions that people register you know those little clickers that you have that, that people mark, mark their, their opinions? We, we capture those data and we put everything in a database run by public sector consultants in Lansing. And we have no idea at the center what the, how these conversations come out until at the end of our campaign, we, un, we open up the data and we study these data and then we write once a year, Michigan's people's campaign program for the year. We listen to what people say, we write it up, we distribute it, and we make that the basis for the priorities of the Center for Michigan. And we do so because we think that embedded in the logic of a democratic society is listening to people bottom up rather than following people from the top down. And that's what we call engage. And we've done this for since 2008, 15 or 20 at a time. We have included in that work more than 45,000 Michigan people, which is the largest public engagement campaign in Michigan history, and maybe one of the largest ones in our country. And we think that it is a fundamental device to engage the people in the process of self-governance, bottom-up, which is what we call democracy. Second verb, inform. We publish free online something called Bridge Magazine. How many of you have heard of it? Wow. OK, great. Um, it comes, it's free. We now have more than a million readers of Bridge Magazine after seven years of publication. According to the Michigan Press Association, we are in the second year of having been named Michigan's best newspaper. Over the last five years, we have won 27 state and national awards for our reporting. We are doing the best journalism in the state by far. 
if you want Bridge Magazine, sign up out at the door, and we will inflict Bridge on you. <laughs> and it's free. Okay? And if you don't like it, yell at me. That's your fourth word. That's my fourth word. <laughs> That's right. I was always a little weak on math. <laughs> Notice we, that there's a connection between engage and inform. The engagement process, if our reporters listen, they learn all of a sudden what ordinary people are thinking. And that teaches them what ordinary people are thinking. On the other hand, when we cover community conversations, we can report and amplify the conclusions of Michigan citizens in Bridge Magazine. And we think that there is a functional connection between engage and inform that most outfits don't get, because it's hard to do. And on top of that, we add a third verb, thank you, uh, achieve. And, and the way that works is that when people in our community conversations begin to kind of cluster around some particular problem or issue, then we take that and then we do journalism. That defines our journalism research. And we cover that subject and we learn stuff about it. And sometimes we take that into the halls of power and we say, you better do something about it. And I want to give you, tell you a story of how that process works because it will give you an insight into the interconnectedness of engage, inform, and achieve. How many of you know of the existence of the federal pre-K program Head Start? Yeah, a whole bunch of you. And most of you also know that pre-K education is really important. More than 90% of American families spend the money to get their kids to pre-K schooling. M Michigan has a program called the Great Start Readiness Program that is kind of designed like Great Start. And it's aimed at four-year-olds who are mostly minority and who are poor and have other disabilities that makes it harder for them to succeed in school. OK, that's a good idea. And at our community conversations about five years ago, most people, when asked, what's the most important thing to do in Michigan, most people said, fix the schools. And then when we asked, how do we go about doing that, they said, pre-K education for all kids. So we started looking at this question. And our reporters discovered that the state legislature today spends about a billion dollars a year per grade in our public schools. But the legislature only spends about $100 million for the entire Great Start Readiness Program. And we further discovered that there were 30,000 four-year-olds in Michigan who were qualified to get into the GSRP program, but they couldn't get in because the legislature wouldn't spend enough money to provide enough places for them. And we ran those stories in Bridge Magazine. And we wrote the headline, Michigan's Forgotten 30,000 Kids. And then we discovered that there's an outfit over in Ypsilanti called the High Scope Education Research Foundation that had just finished a 12-year longitudinal study that had concluded that kids who go through a pre-K program were 25% more likely to graduate from high school than kids who didn't. And we took that information, and I called up the governor, and I said, we'd like to present this to you. He said, fine. We did it. And he looked up, and he said, the question isn't whether. The question is when and how much. Now, here's a piece of realism that goes with hard-edged achievement. There were two other people in the room, and there were the governor's major fundraisers. <laughs> but the governor caught it. He got it. And it then took about six months to persuade the legislature that they were not, that they were underfunding the Great Start Readiness Program, that the kids who needed it the most weren't getting the benefits, and that they needed to solve this problem. 
And over a couple of years time, the legislature has now tripled the amount of investment they are making in pre-K education. And we are in the middle of a research program to find out and determine and be sure that this program is resulting in what the research seems to suggest it is doing. So here is a case in which engage raises the topic. Inform does the reporting that fleshes out the story. And achieve shows how a little outfit like the Center for Michigan can actually go and talk to the governor and talk to the legislature and get something done. That's why we started the center. That's, that, that is so much fun to see the system actually working. And sometimes I just walk into the office and I, I break into laughter because it's, it's just so much fun getting stuff done and actually achieving something. The center is the result of an entrepreneurial founder because entrepreneurs start stuff and they drive it. But in addition to which, we understand that most nonprofit organizations go around with their hands out and they say, please fund me, otherwise we're going to go broke. Well, we have a pretty strict business model and we control our overhead and we control our expenditures very carefully. My family contributes a fair amount of money every year. But having one egomaniacal family supporting something like the Center for Michigan is a recipe for big time trouble. So we insist on meeting the market test. And we look for third party investors to match our family's contribution to the Center for Michigan. And so this is where Michigan's great foundations like Dow and Mott and, and, and Kellogg and Kresge come from. We go to Michigan's great corporations and we go to high net worth individuals. And we've just started doing something relatively new, which we stole from NPR. And it has to do with how we fund Bridge Magazine. And now three times a year, we invite people who read Bridge Magazine to send us a check for 25 bucks or five bucks or 100 bucks. And we will send them a little tax deduction form and they get a tax deduction. And what that, that's called earned revenue in the business. And what that does is go back 100 years to a business model, what newspapers used to have, in which they were supported by the people in their own community who contributed enough money to provide for the newspaper. We started out by raising, I think, honey, 35,000 was what we started with. And we're in the middle of our campaign now. Our goal is 100,000. Our objective is to develop our fundraising capacity to the point where readers of Bridge Magazine are paying the, straight, the freight for Bridge Magazine and thereby returning to a system in which our magazine is responsible to the people who read it and who like it. I don't know if that's going to work, but it's the hope and it's the, and it's the goal. The rhetoric that I wrote in this speech resonates. It says, Michigan and America is today at a hinge in our history. Jesus. <laughs> but, and I, I've just been reading in the uh, biography of General Grant, and, and not since the Civil War has our country been as split and as partisan as it is now. And the consequence of the election two years ago has been that our country and our state are kind of divided into, into tribes. And we're sitting in, in, a, in the same living room, looking across the living room at other people and saying, who the hell are these people? We ain't going to talk with them. After the election, we did a series of focus groups, two in West Michigan, one of which was Trump voters and the other was, was uh, Clinton voters and two in southeastern Michigan. In southeastern Michigan, both groups said that they would not talk to each other. In West Michigan, 
People said they didn't like to talk to each other, but there were some values that enabled them to think that they could work together. One of which was Michigan's a pretty good place to raise a family. And you can trout fish and you can walk in the woods. And, 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 and also, that in West Michigan, the notion of community really means a lot. And people in southeastern Michigan didn't talk about community. It was very striking. We then found six families who were willing to work with us, and we just finished doing a documentary movie trying to get inside the heads and hearts of people who previously wouldn't talk with each other and try to understand where they're coming from. It doesn't matter if you're old, young, or rich, poor. This is what about just treating a person like a human being? Why does it have to be a Democrat versus Republican? It's almost like a gang. You know what I mean? Like, we're the, we're the Crips and we're the Bloods, or we're the Hells Angels and we're the something else. I don't know. We're the Reds and we're the Blues. Right, we're the Reds and Blues. It's like they're gangs and they forget that people are, people are affected by this turf war. <laughs> Why can't they just fix it? I don't understand. It's, that movie uh, we've just finished cutting, it's 48 minutes long, and we are taking it around the state with our community conversations. When you read Bridge Magazine and you ask to see the movie, we can, we can send it out to you. We'll, you, we'll, we'll put a link, link on it. And at the end of the movie, after listening to people saying how awful their opponents are, we held a weekend gathering and people discovered that they could talk. And they could discover how we are linked together by more than blind partisanship. And of course, that's the purpose that lies behind the center. If you think about it, one of the things that we are doing is conducting what might be called an experiment in new American patriotism. Not the kind of stuff in which people get up and say, my country is wonderful and you guys are a bunch of schlumps. But rather, to exercise the question of how do we make our country live to the passion and the hope and the expectation of a great democracy. That's what we try to do. I don't know that it's going to work. But if we don't try to do it, it ain't going to happen. And the only way it does work is with people in this room who are influencers in our state. Sign up to get bridge. Go to community conversations. Listen to your neighbors. Think that what is at risk is a set of historically valid governance institutions that have motivated a great democracy for more than 250 years. That's what we're trying to do. That's why Kathy and I are so happy to be right here. and why I'm delighted to answer any questions that anybody here wishes to ask. Thank you very much. I'm just getting deaf. Okay. How do you choose uh, the 15 people that right. you bring around yeah. together? How, okay. do you, how do you pick them? Sure. Or? Good question. Okay. We go to local organizations, whether they are rotary clubs or church gatherings or any local organization, and invite them to partner with us to encourage people to come to these community conversations. Okay? We can't do it without local partners. Because if we walk into the room and say, oh gosh, we're from the People's Republic of China, or of, of, of Ann Arbor, and listen. <laughs> 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 well, you see, I'm almost 80. What the hell? <laughs> uh, they're, they're not going to, I mean, people are not going to come out unless there's some local validation for what you're trying to do. But there's one added uh, dimension to this that, that I think is important. 
we do try to monitor the kinds of people, excuse me, I'm yelling in your ear, uh, the, the, the kinds of people who do attend our community conversations. And we occasionally find that we don't, that, that, that our audiences skew white, older, better educated, on and on. And, and, and we think it's important that our audiences reflect accurately the demographics of the population of the state. So that when we find community conversations are, do not have enough poor people or enough minority people, we consciously, in future community conversations, positively recruit people like that. And by the time we end our community conversation program in a year, the demography of the participants reflects the nature of the underlying demography of the state to no greater a difference than about 1%. And so we really work at this because we think it's fundamentally important that the way we manage the internal dynamics and disciplines of what we do be transparent and open to scrutiny. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Do you think that the school systems should put a greater emphasis on teaching children the art of compromising? <laughs> well, I, I mean, to, to ask the question is to answer it. Um, well, how do you do that? Well, th well that's, th that's not easy. And, and if you think about a school board or a teacher who starts helping kids learn how to discuss in a civil way things of high emotional content, you're messing with important stuff. This is why historically America has specialized in, in groups that bring ordinary citizens together, people bowling. There was a famous book uh, called, by Robert Putnam called Bowling Alone. And, and, and the idea is that through bowling leagues and churches and service clubs and a lot of things, we learn the arts of being together with one another and learn how to exchange opinions and listen with respect and admiration. I'm not convinced that that can be taught in school, but we can taught, teach children how this process results in good outcomes without necessarily trying to bend minds, they got to learn that. And I'm not... Well, part of the problem is it was, it was uh, computers and the internet. People are getting... Oh, sure. Hard. We're not interacting oh, yeah. with each other. Well, well, no, that, well, that's absolutely right. And, and uh, I'm, I'm scared stiff of it. So I think that one of the things that we need to figure out how to do is to have responsible and responsive news systems. When people write, when I write a column for Bridge Magazine, I will get 20 or 30 emails snarling at me, and we publish every damn one of them, unless they're plainly libelous. <laughs> well, sometimes we publish those too. <laughs> uh, and and because, because any responsible news source needs to provide a way for readers to say, hey, you guys messed up. Um, at least we try to do that. And, and, and I mean, I, I've run a lot of newspapers in my day, and don't think that newspapers are, are never make mistakes. Newspapers make lots of mistakes, okay. But the difference is newspapers need to be willing to admit and correct mistakes so that they are, at the end of the day, a trustworthy component of an information system to help guide a society. Oh, yes, ma'am. First, uh, your documentary is going to be shown on September Oh, 22nd. yes, please. No, get up and say it loud. <laughs> the documentary, 48 minutes long, will be shown at uh, 1 o'clock in uh, City Council Chambers on September 22nd, and you're all invited. Oh. Okay, my question is, how does Bridge guard against, um, how does it construct some kind of boundary between you and your big funding partners, the corporations, so that they do not influence what's published and we don't duplicate what's happening right. on the national scale in politics? Right. 
Uh, there are two answers. One is a general policy answer, and the other is to tell you a story. The general policy answer is with every one of our potential funders, we say, there will come times when you don't like what we publish. You may choose to withhold your money. Fine. Don't tell us what we're going to do. We went to a very large corporation headquartered in Detroit. And during the, that was about five years ago. And during the course of the conversation, it became clear that we were talking about a gift of considerable money and that the corporation imagined that this would be a transaction. Once we recognized that, I said, thank you very much. We've enjoyed being with you, but we're leaving. And I wrote them a note saying it made no sense to continue that conversation. We are managed fiercely enough so that the threat of withdrawal of funds does not bother us. We'd rather it didn't happen. But it sure as hell is not going to affect the way we conduct our newspaper. And that's one of the reasons why having a family standing by the center that has resources, and we can say, this is what we're doing, and you can come after us as long as you want, but we're not going to, we're not going to jeopardize that. I just have a question regarding funding of newspapers and television news and things like that. So we think of journalism as the fourth branch of the American government, and they provide a, a public service, but with the exception of NPR and uh, McNeil layer on PBS, the vast majority of news <coughs> is privately owned. And how, what are some ideas that we can have in the internet age going forward where a public service is provided by private companies? Right. Well, um, I think that what we are trying to do at the center with Bridge Magazine is to develop a new way of thinking about newspapers. Namely, have the publisher of newspapers be a not-for-profit organization that is transparent about its funding and seeks, as best as we can, to prevent commercial interests from infecting the nature of our coverage. There is a lot of chatter in the news business about nonprofit journalism. And and this is this is good. The only problem with nonprofit journalism is that nonprofit journalism is often run by journalists who have no idea whatsoever how to manage a company. And so you've got to find publishers who know something about journalism and who know how to manage a commercial enterprise and do so in effective ways. And that's pretty rare. You don't find a lot of people like that. At the end of the day, I think that, that people in the social media, for example, are going to discover that there are a whole lot of people who are very unhappy with what social media are doing with their private information. And they're scooping that up and pasting it together and selling it for their profit. That's going to lead to trouble for them. And any newspaper will discover that if they become exiled to the place where everybody expects them to have one editorial line, they are going to be speaking into a diminishing audience. Because why the hell do you want to read a newspaper that merely echoes what you think? Now. Having said that, we have a big problem, and it's called by the social psychologists, oh, um, the net effect is, is, is that people tend to agree with other people like them. Fine. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, come and, and, and come and work for the center. <laughs> uh, um, you know, it's, it's a bias confirmation is the, is the thing. Uh, we... we and, and that's what lies behind the fact that lots of people will cluster 
in one area or another area, kind of in their own in their own chimney. We did an experiment a couple years ago in which we urged readers of the New York Times to read the Wall Street Journal. And we urged people to read the Wall Street Journal to read the Times. And in, in effect, to, to urge people to ch shake up their news reading habits. And I have to say that it worked to some degree. Maybe 35% of people were willing to switch. But, but a majority of people, at the end of the day, after the experiment, they didn't like it. The art of governing consists of finding ways to work with people who may not agree with you on specifics, but who share your passion for decent governance. We are moving away from that. All you need to do is look at what's going on in Washington. Michigan, fortunately, is not as much in the thrall of this phenomenon as Washington is. But we, we could become very much similar depending on how things work out. And that's, once again, why Kathy and I drive from the People's Republic of Ann Arbor over to South Haven uh, in order to say to, to a group of people, it doesn't have to be this way. It does not have to be this way. And the only way to change it is to change it. And the only way to do that is to fasten on to an organization that says credibly and realistically, here is a program that we are following that we hope is going to make things better. That's why we do what we do. Thank you for taking part of the evening. I've enjoyed this no end. Thank you.